Okay. So we are recording. This is our ninth episode. Welcome, everybody. Um, we have Dr. Keith Kaufman with us. I'm Matthew with my co-host Aishu here. Uh, and we're going to dive into the, the minds and the psychology of being a, a professional athlete and developing into a professional athlete. Yeah, so Dr. Kaufman is a licensed clinical psychologist specializing in the mental training of athletes and others who wish to improve their health and performance. He has operated in his own private practice since 2008 and currently has two offices within the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. He was a research associate at the Catholic University of America, where he taught undergraduate sports psychology for over a decade. He also co-developed the Mindful Sport Performance Enhancement, or the MSPE, mental training program and co-authored several publications on this MSPE, including a 2018 book published by the American Psychological Association. And he's also the co-founder of the MSPE Institute, which was established in 2019 to promote the integration of mindfulness in sports. We're so glad to have you on the show, Dr. Kaufman. Oh, thank you guys for having me. I, I loved learning about your organization a little bit and happy to hopefully lend some interesting information. So the, the first question that I have um, to kind of kick us off is some people might not be familiar with what sports psychology is. Can you give us a little bit of insight about the practice of sports psychology? So, yeah, well, I, I can say kind of what it is and then the practice of it. Um, so in a lot of ways, sports psychology is a pretty unique topic because it sandwiches together two, uh, two different sciences, two different ideas. Um, it literally is the mind and body, right? So, so sports psychology combines psychology, which is the study of behavior and the study of thoughts and feelings. Um, so we call those like basically mental experiences. Um, and the other side of sports psychology is kinesiology, um, or sometimes it's called exercise science, um, which is essentially the study of the body in motion and understanding you know, physiology and, and biology and kind of how the body works while we're, while we're performing. Um, so sports psychologists really help athletes to understand essentially what's going on with the mind and, and how it interfaces with the body uh, as we prepare for and, and learn and, and ultimately compete in sport. Um, and it's a pretty young branch on the psychology tree. So it's an up and coming area. It's really exciting. So if anyone's watching or listening and, and is looking for something cool to study, I highly recommend sports psychology. Um, it's, it's a chance to contribute to a field that's really emerging and there's, there's a burgeoning interest in it. Um, but it's, it's made such exciting growth and strides in the last, even the last 10 years since I've been in practice. And it's becoming a standard part of what a lot of, even from, from youth athletes all the way up through college and professional athletes are, are exposed to now. So it's a very cool time to be in sports psychology. Yeah, I remember just a few years ago when it started to kind of like enter into to youth sports um, and you were teaching it for, for a while at, at Catholic. What was that, that kind of progression like in a, in a, a baby, um, a baby uh what, what word am i looking for First, a field study. yeah <laughs> so yeah i mean i i sort of, it's funny i have sort of a family history of psychology and and going into college i swore it off as what i wanted <laughs> to do i was like i'm not doing that um and i went to unc chapel hill for college and was fortunate at the time um there was uh, a real kind of founding father of American sports psychology, still, still had a lab there and taught there, and he's since retired. Um, but I took his class, his name was Dr. John Silva, and sports psychology just lit me up. I was oh my gosh, this is a thing? <laughs> wow, you know, wow, like I, I didn't know that this was a thing, and, and I've always loved sports. Um, I know you probably can't see right now. I'm not the tallest guy, I'm not the most athletically endowed guy physically, and so, when I, when I sort of maxed out my athletic potential, um, knowing that I could study and help on the mental side, that, that just opened up this whole new world to me. And um, so I kind of took the, the initial path that he started me on and took that into grad school. And in grad school, they said, hey, you wanna, you wanna start a sports psychology course? And they never offered something like that at Catholic. I was like, sure, <laughs> you know, why not? Let's, um, 
and so you're right. I mean, it was really an emerging science at the time and, and um, you know, to, to be on the cutting edge of that and teaching it. And, and I taught it for so long. I went through several different textbooks and got to see how the science evolved. You're looking at like the citations and the research that are all from like the, you know, the 2000s. And so it's, it's really not an old study. And, and now to be where it is now, it's grown so much in the last 10 years. It really is yeah. very cool to see a science grow up before our eyes. Yeah, definitely. Um, while I was looking at your website, um, The Mindful Competitor, I did see a lot about MSPE. And um, I saw something super interesting to me, at least as a Premier League fan, that MSPE was being used in the Premier League. Um, could you talk a little bit about um, your co-development of the program? Yeah, so, so I, I mentioned grad school a short time ago. So being on sort of the cutting edge of the science in, in graduate school, I decided um, I wanted to do a dissertation study in um, sports psychology, of course, and, um, and mindfulness was really coming into its own in, in mainstream psychology in, in terms of things like pain management. And we were starting to see um, how it could be an out, outgrowth of, of traditional kind of cognitive behavioral approaches, which, which is really what even still today is, is the dominant force in sports psychology, right? So, so essentially changing negative thoughts into positive thoughts. And mindfulness was just a different way of looking at that. And so for my dissertation back in grad school, I helped create or, or really led the creation of this protocol, this, this mental training program that was based in mindfulness. One of the things that frustrated me about sports psych at the time was there just wasn't a whole lot of specific um, programs available where you could really train a mental skill, right? Psychology is so different than physical science and that, you know, if you break a bone, it's like I can do an x-ray and see a broken bone, right? Mm -hmm. But if, if you're trying to train somebody how to focus, for example, yeah. that's a hard thing to see, right? And, and something that really appealed to me about mindfulness is that here is this really in a lot of ways trainable skill set that people can develop. And, and it doesn't just apply to sport, but it applies to life. Um, and so what we find, in, and as we continue to do research, so it grew out of this dissertation study and then became a big part of what I did in my career. And now it's grown into this MSPE Institute where we're consulting internationally with um, everything from youth organizations up as, as you mentioned, um, professional organizations. And there's been a lot of increased interest in elite sport in how do we apply mindfulness. Um, and certainly we've seen that here in the States, we've seen um, you know, people like Phil Jackson and people like Pete Carroll, you know, really elite coaches um, who have made no secret of the fact that they've embraced mindfulness and have had a lot of great success in terms of their teams on the field. Um, so that's, I think, helped along, made people open to it. Um, and so um, I was actually very fortunate. I went to a conference that in Europe, they decided to try to get together all the people, the small group of people who were doing this, this work in mindfulness and sport. And, and so I was there. And actually someone else who was there was one of the main sports psychologists for Southampton Football Club, um, who uh, just was building and, and continues to build what they're doing in sports psychology at Southampton is really phenomenal um, and, and really progressive and really leading the way in a lot of ways in, in sports science and elite sport. Um, and so uh, my, my institute, we've done a fair amount of consulting with them now and helping them to implement, they don't exclusively do MSPE, uh, Mindful Sport Performance Enhancement, our program, um, but they do do a fair amount of that and they've integrated it with some other stuff that, that they do and they have their own kind of model and philosophy that they, that they use. Um, but to see how, how Southampton has really integrated mindfulness into their whole academy system up through the senior team and, and the players you see you know, every Saturday or Sunday morning, if you're watching the Premier League here in the States, um, it's, it's really cool and exciting. Yeah. What are, what are some of the ways that they're implementing that on the academy level? Yeah, so, um, well, the, you know, their whole approach is, is holistic. They, they want to try to help, um, not just with mindfulness, but, but expose the younger kids to sports psychology at an early age. So that's just a part of what they do. Yeah. Um, all the way through so that when they get to the senior team, when they get to the most elite level, that's already part of the fabric of, of the team, the culture and, and how they approach the sport. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, they're doing a lot. Again, mindfulness is a piece and MSPE is a piece of what they're doing. But, but overall, um, they're really making an effort to have 
specific times and specific exposure to sports psychology. And then they're also integrating sports psychology and, and mindfulness specifically into other aspects of the academy system. So things like strength and conditioning um, and, and recovery and, and medical staff. Um, the way that they talk about it is trying to get everybody speaking the same language, right? So it's not just like you go to the psychologist or the sports psychologist and hear one thing and then you don't hear it for the rest of your day, right? They want all the coaches, they want all of the, the staff that the players are interacting with to, to be on the same page. And, and so the level of integration uh, that they're building is really, it's, it's miles ahead of, of its time. It's really an inspirational model that they're building. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I think it's an important message in any organization that has different levels of development to, to keep that message consistent. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that goes into the, the development of mindfulness. I wonder if that has impacted their, their success in, in homegrown players, in taking players from the academy and, and then going directly into the first team. So I wish I had some lovely statistics to throw at you. I, I don't know in terms of what the actual numbers would be. I, I, what I can speak is a little more anecdotal and, and we have helped with doing some pilot research there. And I know that they've really um, invested in trying to collect good data to support the programming that they're doing, but that's all very much in process. So I don't have any, any wonderful statistics to throw at you yet, but maybe we can do this again sometime and I can, I can tell you what they found. Um, but just from, from anecdotal reports that, that I'm aware of so far um, is I think the players, uh, many of them have really embraced it and seem to see a lot of value in, in the sports psych program and, and in mindfulness specifically. Um, and, and I think it's important too to highlight what another unique aspect of sports psychology is you're kind of talking about performance, right? So mental performance and, and how we can maximize our mental execution um, on the pitch or on the field, but you're also talking about mental health in some ways. And so something that, that uh, Southampton has done, which I think is a, is a really vital part of their model, is they have both a clinical psychologist on staff and sports psychologists on staff who, who collaborate and work together. So they're addressing the mental health aspect in addition to the performance aspect. And I think that's a big part of what you're gonna see like to, to get to your question. Um, so not only are they going to have mentally tough, um, mentally resilient athletes, but also athletes who are, who are healthy and, and well-balanced and, and are able to do things like manage the pressures of being an elite athlete, right? Because that's such a big part of the lifestyle. Um, so I, I think that's huge. Yeah, I think that's a, a fantastic point in destigmatizing. And I think the, the connection between performance enhancement and mental health has really helped to, to move that process along. Yeah, and we, we've seen that evolution here, like mm -hmm. in, the, in the US too. I, I think there've been a number of athletes and coaches and, and um, organizations that have helped really raise mental health awareness within sport. Um, I think the way that sports psychology has really gained traction is through the performance enhancing elements, and it's really been in the last year or two. Yeah. Um, especially like names that come to mind, people like Michael Phelps, have, have raised a lot of awareness to it that, um, you know, people are starting to switch to this sort of integration of, yeah, it's still the performance enhancing side, but also making sure that we're attending to mental health as well. Um, and, and that is crucial to be looking at this from, from both angles. Yeah, kind of on a similar note, you talked a little bit about the um, importance of mental health between sports, regardless of what kind of sport it is, but back to like sports psychology, does it differ? Does the approach to mental health, to performance enhancement, does it differ between different sports, different athletes, if there is any difference at all? Yeah, I mean, I think, well, yes and no, right? So, so there, there, are, there are ways that I wouldn't say you're gonna fundamentally treat a, a soccer player differently than you would a basketball player. It's not like you throw out the rule book and it's a completely different thing. Now that said, as a sports psychologist, what we're often working toward is what's called integration, right? So we, we wanna be integrated within a system so that we can understand, it's almost like a team or an academy or a program like District, district Rain. It has its own culture, yeah. right? It has its own way of operating. And, and so sports psychologists need to do a good job of learning about the particular culture 
of, of the teams of the organizations that they're helping with so that they can, you know, kind of in, individualize or, or make it specific to, to the group, right? So, so there's a lot of techniques, like something like mindfulness, um, you know, you can use across sports. Um, now, there's certainly different challenges that, that are associated with each sport and being a team sport or an individual sport and the level of sport and the age of the athletes, right? So there's a lot of variability there. Um, but, but I think a, a real important part of a sports psychologist's job is, is becoming a part of a system or at least learning enough about the system so that they can tailor the work to, to the athletes that they're working with. And that, to be honest, has been a big problem historically in, in sports psychology, not because sports psychologists aren't interested in doing that, but um, as you guys may have experienced in your own careers, right, sport tends to be a rather closed off world. Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of times, you know, people weren't open to having sports psychologists be a part of things, or they only wanted sports psychologists to be a part of things when something was wrong, like, hey, come on in and fix this problem and then leave, <laughs> right, which that's, that's kind of called parachuting in, like you parachute in, you fix it, and you leave, and um, and lo and behold, what we found is that's not the best way to see change, right? That's not the best way to see improvement over time in, in um, certainly the mental execution aspects, but also mental health, right? So, so a lot of times in my work, um, and certainly in our, in our mindfulness program, we really parallel um, the, the psychological investment, the psychological work to physical practice. The physical training, right? You, you, you go and you lift and you run and you do all the things to get your body in shape over time. And, and sports psychologists kind of need the same leash to be able to go out and have the access um, and help people practice this systematically over time, you know, in the way that's most meaningful and important to them. Hopefully that's not too elusive an answer to your question, but it kind of, it's like yes and no, right? There's a lot of, a lot of overlap, but also a lot of tailoring. Yeah. Um, a little bit of a follow-up, actually, when you mentioned the individ individualistic portion of sports psychology, mm -hmm. uh, it reminded me of uh, something that I've been thinking about for a little bit. Like, how does an athlete's background, upbringing, like, affect their approach to their own mental health or how you specifically tailor your work to that specific athlete? Well, it's huge, right? I mean, th these are people, right? And so the athletes, that's one of the hats they wear. That's maybe one of the things that they do. Um, I, and, and without di diverting too much, because the other thing about sports psychology is there's a lot of different pathways that people can take to get into sports psychology. Um, in my particular pathway, I took a, a clinical psychology. I know when you introduced me, you mentioned I'm a licensed clinical psychologist. I took a clinical psychology pathway and, and specialized in sports psychology so that, yeah, I got the sport and performance training, but also really learned how to handle mental health and to be able to treat the whole athlete. Um, there are many ways to do it. I'm not saying that my way is the right way, but certainly the way that I look at it is, you know, if, if someone's going to reach out to me because they're having a performance issue, almost certainly it's going to reflect something else that's going on in their lives. It's not like we just have anxiety in this one situation, for example, and it doesn't manifest anywhere else or come from anywhere else. So, you know, as soon as you start talking to an athlete, you find out, well, gosh, this person's having some anxiety on the soccer field, but also they're under a lot of pressure from their parents. Um, or maybe they feel like soccer is their way out of poverty, or, you know, that's the only way they're going to go to college is if they get a scholarship. And and you quickly realize this is about a whole lot more than than just how do I focus on the field? This is you know, my identity as a player and how it interfaces with all these parts of my life. Um, so I think who the person is and the kind of off the field stressors they're dealing with is a huge part of what happens on the field. Yeah, that's yeah. super important. I think of it a lot. Every, everything is, is connected and you can only be the, the player on the field that you are off of the field because mm -hmm. that everything does inform it. That's right. And, and it's tricky, right? Because, because in a way, what we ask people to do is almost like live in a bubble when they're out there performing, like just focus on this one thing. Yeah. And so part of, part of what's challenging and, and wonderful about, about this profession is that you help people kind of across the spectrum of their lives and, and sort of understand themselves and integrate this, you know, athletics into a part of their identity. But then also how when they're on the field, how can they focus and kind of let other things go and, 
learn how to, how to maximize the experience while they're out there on the field. Um, so there are just so many different dimensions to it, to, to the kind of the, the interface of the performance and also the, the mental health aspects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something that, um, that we've kind of gone back and forth with is the, the pregame, right? Mm. Some players have a different um, set of rituals. Um, some players want to be hyped before they go out there. Um, some players want that like peace and quiet or that kind of peace and quiet with the group. Everybody's got a different ritual. How does sports psychology kind of analyze that and, and maybe tailor that to, to fit the, the player the best way? Yeah, well, I, I think in, in sports psychology, or at least in, in the work that I do, I really encourage athletes to be intentional mm -hmm. in the way they approach their games, right? And, and so mm -hmm. mindset isn't something you turn on and off like a faucet. It's, it's all about consistency and, and how you approach things. So, um, you know, actually, it's funny, like in, in sports psych, we actually make a distinction between the idea of a ritual and what we'd call a routine. Um, right. So a ritual in some ways implies almost like like a superstition, which can be a little bit different than a routine, which is a series of behaviors that a lot of athletes go through kind of systematically or, or habitually um, before they perform. And that can start, you know, the night before all the way up to just before or even depending on your sport, like you'll see like before someone takes a penalty shot, for example, in soccer, um, you'll see people go through a little routine often to help them kind of get into the appropriate mindset. So um, I, I use routines all the time in my work because I think it's a really effective way to help people be intentional in their focus, right? So um, kind of knowing that the choices that you make pre-game, as you're saying, um, have an effect on how you show up, right? So even th there's some research evidence that shows um, that, that your heart rate is influenced by the beat of the music that you listen to. And something that a lot of athletes will do is listen to music before, before they go out and compete. And if you're someone who tends to run a little hot, which I know a lot of times we think about athletes getting pumped up before a game, but actually the bigger problem is that some at, most athletes are actually need to calm down a little bit before a game, or less commonly someone actually needs to fire themselves up. Um, and so to be aware, for example, like where's my, where's my tension level? Where's my stress level? And maybe I should listen to some music that will help me get into this sort of optimal zone that I want to be in to go out there and play soccer. Yeah. Right. And that zone is going to look different than a linebacker in football or is going to look different than a golfer. Right. So to kind of be aware of where your body's at and what the skill is and, and to take intentional steps to prepare yourself to execute what you're going to need to do out there. That's really great insight. What, what would you recommend for a player that doesn't turn on until the second half? So he gets there, the first half is kind of ineffective, he's kind of uh, ghosting, and then after halftime, he goes on, scores a hat trick, and is just a fantastic all-around player. Mm -hmm. I mean, something like that, right? So if someone came to me and said, hey, this is something that, that I'm experiencing. It's a problem that I have is I'm a, I'm a second-half player, and I want to be a whole game player. Yeah. Um, I mean, the first thing I'd want to do is understand why. Like, let's talk about, let's explore what's going on there. Right. And, and so you never want to take something for granted and say, oh, OK, I know what it is. You know, this is how it always is, because everyone's got their own version and their own experience for why that might be. Um, but for something like that, what you're describing, I would say a, a very common explanation, not always, but a common explanation might be they're really tight in the first half. And, and what tends to happen is that people, as they as they start to perform and get into the groove, they tend to loosen up and, and get better. Um, and so for someone like that, we might try to look at, well, how, how can you, again, maybe use something like a routine or, or something like mindfulness practices to try to help release some, some extra tension in your body before a game so that it's easier for you to find your flow and rhythm sooner, um, right? So, so I think at least the way I work with athletes is I want them to be curious about themselves. Yeah. I want them to wonder, gosh, why is that happening? Right. Too often we're like, oh, I stink. I suck. I'm a, I'm a second half player. And, you know, we, we turn on ourselves and it makes us the opposite of curious. Right. We kind of okay. shut things down. And and I want to invite people to be curious to try to understand, well, why is that happening? And once I understand my mind and my body a little bit better, 
okay, well, there's a number of things that we could do to, to try to help you work with your mind and body to, to try to address something like that. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think that that's something that, that a lot of players don't think about is, am I, am I curious about myself? Am I curious about analyzing why I did that or why I behaved like that or what this or how this affected me? But then it's a really good question. I think that's true. And I, and I think a big, a big issue, and, and maybe you guys can speak to that too. I, I don't know what your views are on this, but I certainly see in my work that sports are so incredibly outcome focused, mm -hmm. just so incredibly focused on the results, whether it be of a particular game or am I going to get that scholarship or am I going to make it as a pro, right? So, so yeah. looking to the future, whether it's the near term future or, or the longer term future and, and how how consuming that can become, how much pressure that tends to put on us. And it really robs us of the opportunity to be in the moment that we're in and, and to be curious, right? Like you said, I, I think we're often in such a rush to get to the next step or to, or to know what's gonna happen next that, that we don't invite that kind of curiosity. But it's that curiosity, it's that kind of approach that actually puts us in a whole lot more control over our mental game, right? To be present focused, to have our mind and body aligned, that my focus is right in the here and now where my body is, that's where it's at. That's where we have power as a performer. Yeah. I feel like that can apply for a lot of other things, like even test taking or just school in general. Yeah, right. I mean, and yeah, it's a fair point. I shouldn't just say it's sports, right? That we live in a, in a society or, or there are so many areas of achievement that, that are so, so heavily emphasizing the result and the outcome and, and it really robs us of the of this vital power and, and also kind of makes us really anxious and self-critical in a lot of ways and and so what i see are a lot of even young kids who learn this you know from from their experiences in sport at an early age you know that they're so hard on themselves they yeah. just push and push and are so dissatisfied all the time and and trying to help them slow down and just be curious and be present it's it's really hard you know, it's, it's so compelling and, and, and I think so heavily enforced across their lives that what matters is the result. How do we, how do we change that focus? How do we rebrand that, that thought process? Well, I'm glad to hear someone like you ask that question because you're a real stakeholder, right? You, you run a whole club system. Yeah. And, and so when going back to like what we were saying with Southampton, um, you know, they, they're savvy to things like this and they're realizing, you know what, we, we want our whole system to embody this, this kind of approach, right? That, that the stakeholders, that to hear it from, from the, the coaches all the way down to, um, you know, to, to just the, the staff people that they interact with, that everyone's on the same page in saying like, hey, let's slow down and be curious and be open and be present focused. I, I think it's people like you who can make a huge difference. Um, you know, I think it really is the adults in kids' lives who they learn this from. <laughs> um, and I get it. I get it. And, and, and sometimes I'll say something like this and people will say, oh, you know, Keith, you're saying I shouldn't care about winning, right? Of, you know, what is that? Or I shouldn't care about a scholarship or money? Like, come on, right? But okay, well, those things matter. Those things are important, of course. But if that's what you're thinking about while you're trying to develop or where you're trying to perform as an athlete, it's really stifling. Yeah. Um, it's not actually the way to get to those goals if that's what you really want. Yeah, I think it, it is such a focus on the outcome and we forget to fall in love with the process. We forget to love the journey of why are we even looking to get to this outcome? Why are we trying to achieve this? Exactly. Exactly. And, and I think the other piece, and, and, and this, I would say, you know, anxiety is probably the number one thing that I deal with in, in my work. And the specific kind of anxiety that I see the most is fear of failure, right? And, and what you're talking about, Matt, the, it's, it's that approach that makes people so terrified to fail because they're not, there's no process, yeah. right? There, there's only like, you know, if I lose this game or if I miss this shot or if I, if I make this mistake, it's so devastating because that perspective is lost. It's just, okay, well, this was one moment, you know, I'm going to have another game to go out there and play again. Right. Or, or even another play, right. To, to, to have the next play. And, and so, uh, you know, another, another premier league team, um, 
under a former administration, I, I'm not aware of if they're currently still doing this, but, but Chelsea Football Club for a time, they developed what was called a mind room. And what they would do is um, they had their athletes essentially watch film of themselves making mistakes and, and taught them how to essentially enter a meditative state while they were watching that so that they got practice at being non-reactive. They got practice at being in the moment observing a mistake and letting it go because they wanted that to be a skill set that they had on the field. Um, and, and so you've got to be process oriented if you're going to be able to do that, right? Yeah. So many athletes want to do that, just move on, but they can't move on because they're too outcome focused and they get paralyzed with fear. Yeah. That's some serious rewiring of the brain though. Yeah. But the great news about it, and this is what, this is why sports psychology is coming out and getting all this, this traction is because we have, literally neuroimaging techniques now in, in that show that the brain can rewire, wow. that, that doing this kind of training, it actually makes a difference, right? Like for example, with mindfulness, there are studies that show that mindfulness practice strengthens those areas of the brain that help with managing attention and that help with positive emotion and, and things like that. Exactly the kinds of things that, that you would hope to see on the field if you do mindfulness practice, there's evidence that your brain literally changes the way it functions. Um, through that practice. Wow. I'll, uh, Aisha, you have a, the next question. Yeah, um, I was just thinking like, you know, if I'm an anxious player, for example, and I want to like rewire my brain to <laughs> have it, <laughs> to have myself be a little less anxious on the pitch, but obviously like I don't have access to, you know, a psychologist or a sports psychologist to get help from. What are some tips that you could give to like, me as an individual that I can use to yeah. better myself? Well, I think the, the good news is, is even if you don't have access to a sports psychologist, is there's a lot of free resources out there available that, that you can do a lot of reading about this. And there's lots of um, tools that are available like online for free. I think, mm -hmm. you know, there's different ways to get at this. So I'll just speak to my bias and, and what I tend to work on with athletes is in order for us to be anxious, we basically, by definition, have to have a future-based way of paying attention, right? We're thinking about the outcome. We're thinking about what's happening next. We're feeling threatened by that, and therefore, we're feeling anxious, right? Our body is warning us of that perceived threat. And so if you were going to practice something, what I would practice is trying to work with your focus to try to be more present-focused. And so, like, for example, and this is a bit of a shameless plug, but I will throw it out there that... We have a website, our MSPE Institute has a website, which is mindfulsportperformance.org. Um, and on our website, if you register for free with our site, you get access to a whole bunch of practices um, that you can listen to and you can do that help with doing exactly what I just said, that help with becoming more present focused. Um, but recognizing that this is something that you do need to practice, right? Like you, you said, how do I rewire my brain? And and the, the exciting answer is you can, you can rewire it. The, the less sexy answer, the less exciting answer is it takes a lot of practice. It takes a lot of training, right? It's like when you go to the gym, you know, if you want to get cut, if you want to, if you want to be toned and, and be in shape, you got to do a lot of workouts. Um, and, and so, you know, sites like mine that offer free resources might be a way to, to begin a practice like that. Um, but, but I think as this stuff gains more traction and it becomes more accepted, you are seeing more stuff available. Um, another resource that just at least a mindfulness resource that I recommend that is totally free um, is, is there's an app that's called Insight Timer. Um, and I recommend that for a lot of folks that I work with. It literally has thousands of free meditation practices that you can do. And some of them are sport specific. They have some sport meditations on there. Um, a lot of them aren't, they're just more general. But um, you know, if you have zero budget, um, but just have access to the internet, you can register with Insight Timer and, and do some of those free practices. So um, there is good stuff out there, even if you don't have individual access to a sports psychologist. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> sure. Let's move into the, the world of players that aren't performing because they're injured and the, the mentality that that goes along with that. Sure. Um, well, that's that's sort of a whole a whole breed of of player, right? Is is 
Um, you know, just like we physically rehabilitate from, from injury, there's a mental impact to that too. Um, and there's a whole host of things that people can experience. And I, I, I'm sure we don't have the time to go into everything right now, but in a general sense, you know, feelings like anxiety, some depressive symptoms, um, feeling isolated, feeling alone, feeling a little bit alienated because, you know, you're not able to do what, what you ordinarily do, or you're not a part of the team in the same way that you are a part of the team. Um, or even just fears of having to go through like a medical procedure or fears of, is my body going to be the same again? Or am I going to get re-injured, right? That that there's any number of very normal reactions that athletes have. Um, and fortunately, a lot of athletes do a pretty good job of getting through that, um, even if they're not giving specific attention to, to their mental recovery. Um, but certainly there are, there are a significant minority who don't adjust so well to injury, and, and sports psychologists are there to help. And they're also there to help even when people might otherwise be okay on their own just because sports psychologists can, can provide education and provide some coping tools um, for athletes to be able to help work through that stuff because it really is a big deal when we get hurt, of course, depending on the severity of injury. Um, the, the parallel that you most commonly see in the sports psychology literature is, is to grief, right? That, that even like if you think about the, the loss of a loved one or, or when something really upsetting happens to us, we will experience a grief reaction. And, and you often see athletes who are injured going through a grief reaction themselves so that brings with it a whole host of, of symptoms. And I think a lot of players might be going through that with the, the current pandemic. Some of those, those feelings that you described, you know, not knowing what's gonna happen with their bodies, with, the, with their team, with their teammates, not engaging on ways that they might be normal. Um, I think that a lot of players might be going through similar things right now as well. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, I've seen a whole range of reactions to, to people from this and mm -hmm. it's like we're living history, right? So, so what's true one week may be a little bit different the next week, but um, fortunately I've seen a lot of really healthy and good adaptation from, mm -hmm. from the athletes that I work with. But, but yeah, to your point, there, there is a lot of anxiety out there. There's a lot of grief. Um, I know that, that, you know, at the professional level um, and also like at the college level, um, I know the NCAA has tried to be diligent about this, like through their Sports Science Institute. Um, you know, they've tried to release some ideas for how um, teams can still have access to each other and, and you know, through remote conversations, right, to, to try to have that connectivity still. Um, but I know like, for example, my son is a youth sport athlete, he's seven, and he's been totally disconnected from youth sport through all of this. And so I think for, for younger kids, um, it's, it's really hard. This is, they're, they're, they're completely removed from, from things that, that mean a lot to them in a lot of cases and, and that are important outlets for them and important ways that they develop and grow socially. Um, and, and so I think we're certainly seeing that impact, but I think that impact is probably going to still continue to be felt even as we reopen and, and kids start to return to youth sport. Yeah, for sure. I should be on the net. Yeah, I, I was just going to add on, like, I think the one, you know, bright spot in this whole COVID-19 mess is that it's happening at a time when, you know, we have the ability to connect with each other in more than one way. <laughs> like right now, we can at least see each other's faces, even though we can't meet in person. Yeah, I, I think it'll be so interesting to see how how society changes from from this, you know, from from the, the capacity that we've shown to be virtual and to connect. And I agree with you. I think that's a really great observation. I think, I think the two thing, I mean, I mean, it's interesting because as much as there's been a lot of grief, I've also heard a lot of athletes speak about gratitude, which, which is, and I'm glad it's coming up now because I think any talk of sports psychology, the idea of gratitude and compassion coming up is really important because those are, those are foreign terms to a lot of athletes and actually very, very powerful sports, like, sports psychological concepts. Um, but, uh, I, I think a lot of people are feeling grateful for the virtual connectivity and also for the time of year that it's happening, right? That it's happening in the spring and into early summer where we can be outside and go for walks. And even if you can't play soccer with your team, for example, you can still go for a lovely run and, and still do some training that way. So I, 
if this were happening in January and snowstorms were happening while this was going on, I think that would be a whole other layer to this. Yeah, it'd be a, another Cabin Fever sequel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. So as we, as we start to move on to the end of uh, end of our show, um, thinking about a, a mentality toolbox for for an athlete, what are some tools or some strategies that would be in in there for for them? Well, I think, like I said, uh, I, I think education in and of itself, I guess that's not really a tool, but just being open, being curious about yourself and, and trying to arm yourself as, as coaches, but as players as well, um, with just some better understanding of what sports psychology is and, and how, how your mind works and why it's doing what it's doing. Because um, a lot of this really is human nature. And of course, you're going to be a little bit anxious before a game, right? And, and to kind of realize, oh, you know, this is what my brain is doing is, is actually a very useful technique. Um, and, and I think, you know, in a nutshell, the things that I work on most often with people are, are being aware of attention and focus. I think that is an absolutely critical uh, factor in sport performance and in life in general, but certainly in sport performance. Um, being aware of emotions and feelings and, and um, how you can begin to work with those and, and of thoughts, right? So the thoughts that occur to us and, and how we can relate to those. Um, so I, I realize this, this isn't a neat and tidy little toolbox where it's like, hey, do this and then do that because it's messy, right? It's, it's like any other science where it kind of depends. It depends on what the issue is or what kind of muscle you're trying to build up. Right. Um, but, but I think, you know, especially focus, emotions like anxiety, um, you know, the, the way our inner dialogue, the way we think to ourselves, the way we treat ourselves. I mentioned a moment ago, the idea of compassion, right? Uh, and, and I think this goes right along too with being process focused um, is, is oftentimes we tend to motivate ourselves with fear and self-criticism in sport and kind of realizing that this that may not be, even though that can produce some results, there's, there's, it's not like there's zero value in doing that. It's really not the most efficient way of doing it and it can be quite harmful. So, yeah. so realizing that there are ways that we can treat ourselves that actually help us get the most out of, out of our sporting experiences and our performances, that's, I think, a really important tool and, and realization. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, like, as we are reaching the, the end of the hour here, the last 10 minutes, we could open it up to questions from the audience. Normally we get one or two um, sure. from people listening in right now. Um, but in the meantime, while people submit their Q&A questions, um, I was going to ask, how can a coach or um, you know, assistant coaches best support their players when, you know, not everyone has a sports psychologist on hand. What are some hmm. tools that a coach can use? Well, I think we've already hit on a number of things in this discussion. I, I think for a coach to, to do some educating of him or herself on sports psych, right? I'm sure a lot of coaches are very comfortable with um, technical techniques and physical techniques and, and knowing, for example, in, in your sport, how to coach soccer. Um, and realizing that a part of that too is, is doing some, some training and, and doing some reading perhaps on, on the mind. And, and you know, not, not that they're supposed to be sports psychologists themselves, but just you know, being aware of the science and, and some of the best practices out there. I think too, um, like we were saying earlier, trying to promote as much as possible a process approach. Um, you know, as a coach, you're a teacher, and, and I would say your, your greatest job is to try to help promote athletes to master, to master their skill and, and to instill that value on mastery, not on perfection, not on results, um, you know, that, that everything is a growth opportunity, everything is a chance to get better, and, and how as a coach can I help you get better today? Um, as opposed to I'm looking to save my own job or make a bigger name for myself or you know, preserve my undefeated record, right? That yeah. it's about the player and it's about helping the player develop in their process. To kind of feedback on that, how many like coaches or administrators do you work with versus the amount of players? 
Yeah, I mean, in my private practice work, um, I work a lot with, with athletes themselves. Um, I think in, in the MSPE work, the, the more the consulting, the mindfulness work that I do, um, it's more mixed. And I think a lot of times, at least coaches are kind of the gatekeepers, right? So we might work with coaches first. And then if we end up doing some training with the teams, it's, it's really starting with the coaches and with the systems. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so I think it kind of depends a little bit. I feel fortunate that I get to work across, across levels. Um, but I can't emphasize enough for, for sports psychology to work. Um, it really is important for like Southampton talks about for everyone to be speaking the language. Um, you know, I, I could sit here as a sports psychologist and say, you know, Hey, soccer player, be nice to yourself, be present focused. Um, you know, here are some ways to work with your anxiety. And then they go out on the field and their coach is tearing into them and, making them terrified to play the game and that's going to make their job a lot harder right so so if i'm working with the athlete but also working with the coach along the way so that everyone's pulling together i think that's a vital part of how we ultimately promote healthy systems it's a great um kind of a great snapshot that healthy system we think about it you know with we grow up and we see the ecosystem in our science book and we see the, the world around us, but we don't stop and really think about the healthy system that we're living in, the healthy system that we are creating. Yeah. I think that's really powerful. I mean, when you think about it, right, like a lot of organizations or a lot of teams, they're like families. They're like a family system. And, and so, you know, if, if there's an issue in a family, you can work with an individual in that family, but ultimately you know, for, for, the, for the family to run as smoothly as it can, it means all the moving parts have to be pulling together. And, and it works that way in sports too, right? You, you can't just quote unquote fix an athlete, right? It's, it's how do they exist within that larger system and, and getting the system to be healthy and pulling together. That's, that's the key. Yeah. So we, don't, we haven't had any questions come in yet, but I know that one of the players that's watching has had a an experience with a multitude, a multitude of coaches that are kind of the, the way that you described it. They would make a mistake and the, the coach would immediately start tearing into them or immediately sub them. So now years down the road, you know, every mistake that's made, always looking to the sideline and, and kind of seeing that, that conditioning happening over the process of a youth player's career mm-hmm. um, doesn't indicate a healthy system. So hopefully I think that this player has got a, uh, a lot of insight into maybe why that, that's happening um, over the course of our discussion. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, something that is so hard, especially when you're working with an individual is recognizing if they're a part of a system like that, or mm-hmm. if they have coaches like that, and in sports, the reality is there often is a power differential, right? Where, where we have to, as an athlete, defer to the coach. Yeah. That can be such a hard thing. But, but ultimately, what I will try to do with an athlete in a situation like that is try to strengthen his or her voice mm-hmm. and his or her sense of choice over how ultimately they treat themselves, right? That, that a coach can yell and scream all he wants to or she wants to or bench, you know, bench the player. The, the coach is going to do what the coach is going to do. Yeah. And, and sometimes this is a really hard task, but, but for the player to recognize, okay, you know, ultimately for me to be at my best, that means that I have to be operating a certain way and I can't control my coach. All I can control is how I, how I treat myself um, and trying to create a little bit of a buffer there. Um, and sometimes that's easier said than done. I get that. If you're watching this and thinking, oh yeah, right. That sounds real easy. I get, yeah, it's easier said than done, but the, the, kind of saving grace here, but also one of the biggest frustrations that all of us have in life and in sport is that the only thing we can ever control is ourselves in the present moment. If we try to control more than that, almost always it opens the door to anxiety and frustration. Um, so, so sometimes that's not a very satisfying message, but realizing that that's where our power is. And if you sink your teeth into that, that's how you can be most effective. That's, that's something I really try to impart in, in a situation like what that player might be facing. Yeah. It's a fantastic insight. Aishu, do you have any more questions? 
I, I would just say too, I want to compliment you guys. I know it sounds like you, you started up this initiative with these podcasts, but you asked the question before and it was staring me right in the face. I should have said something then. You know, you talk about free resources and what people are trying to do, things like this podcast and, and even having someone like me on to talk about things like this, I think is really an awesome effort that you guys are making. So I want to commend District Rain and thank you guys for having me and giving a forum to hopefully talk to people who may not know much about this, but to know that it's out there. And if this is something you want to do, you know, as a profession or something that you want to understand more as an athlete, that, that this does exist and, and you, can, you can learn a lot in, in some accessible ways. So thank you guys for, for doing this. Yeah, yeah and thank you. Um, I'll definitely be reaching out to hear more about those free resources so we can get them out <laughs> to the and they can use them as well. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and I mentioned, so I'm, I'm locally based. I'm here in DC. I mentioned our, our MSPE website. I also have a, a website for my practice, which is just keithkaufmanphd.com. So if anyone wants to reach out to me, just, you know, has questions or, or wants to learn more about this stuff, um, you know, please don't be shy. Feel free to, to contact me. You can contact me through the site. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. So, no questions from the audience. Aishu, do you have any last comments before we, we wrap up our wonderful discussion tonight? Um, I think I had all of my questions answered, for sure. Yeah. It was a very interesting discussion. I had a lot Good. of questions answered, and I had a lot of questions created. <laughs> um, so I think this is, this is definitely a, a massive, um, a massive episode for us uh, in terms of, of content. Um, and I, I just really want to express how, how grateful we are that you were able to, to share your, your time and your talent with us. Of course, well, happy to. And, and if you have more questions too, please you reach out as well, I'm happy. <laughs> like I said, I, I, my, my soapbox issue is I, I, I am not a fan of parachuting in. You know, I don't believe yeah. in the whole drop in, say a few things, and then leave and never be a part of things again. So if, yeah. if there's some ideas here that are appealing and we want to continue the discussion, then please know that I'm here and, and yeah. want to be a resource. Definitely. I would definitely take you up on that, for sure. Cool. Well, thank you guys very much for having me. Thank you. Thank we'll see you. Um, oh, wait. We have our sponsors. Sorry. <laughs> 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 we have to thank the people that give us money. And they are leveling the playing field helps us out with equipment, um, making sure that all of our athletes are equipped to perform the beautiful game. One step beyond fitness, helping out with our spiritual and physical conditioning and BNG screen printing, um, helping out with all of our apparel from our hoodies to our game uniforms. Thank you everybody. And we'll see you on our next episode.